stand with me as we read this morning from Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 15. When one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But Jesus said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for this day that brings us together. And although it's cold outside, it's warm inside as we have the opportunity to fellowship with those of of like spirit, of like faith. And we're reminded of how you have commanded us to not, us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together so that we could stir each other up to love and good works. And we pray that that will indeed be the outcome of our time together. Lord, we pray right at the moment that you will open up this word to us in a new way. We ask that we will understand the meaning but beyond that, that we will understand what it is that you are asking of us as a result of this word that you have provided. Father, we thank you for the Spirit of God who ministers. Sometimes give that third person of the Trinity a little bit of short shrift because his job is to point to the Son and to the point to the Father and to to make them known. We pray this morning, Father, that our hearts will be open to the work of the Holy Spirit, the one who can explain from 1 Corinthians 2 and from 1 John 2, who can explain the things and the deeper things of God. That's what we long for and we pray for. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. If you have not already, please turn with me to the 14th chapter of Luke. <clears throat> There's this story, uh, probably apocryphal, and I don't even remember. It's about one of the great football coaches, although I've seen it told a lot of different ways, but uh, makes the point anyway. Maybe Vince Lombardi. Uh, think of him anyway. He's, uh, he's reading the, the article in the paper one day, and it talks about uh, the fact that, wow, the coach we have may be one of the greatest coaches of the century. And uh, he's taking this press to heart. He looks in the mirror just to see what a great coach looks like. And then he says to his wife, I wonder how many great coaches there really are. And she says to him, well, I don't know, but I tell you this, I think it's probably one less than you think. Um, sometimes we all need somebody to bring us down to earth a bit, right? And so he did, she did. But this is the same warning that Jesus is issuing in this passage of Scripture with regard to the kingdom of God. How many will be there? And his response basically is, be careful. It may be one less than you think. It's a wonderful passage, really. It pictures for us the glories of the kingdom of God. It's the feast to end all feasts. The Bible often, from Old Testament to the end of the book in the book of Revelation, uses the feast to emphasize the greatness of the kingdom. And the invitation is open to everyone, absolutely everyone without exception. No one too bad to accept the invitation. No one too good not to need the invitation. It's open to everyone. But underlying the greatness of the glory is the grave warning that not everyone is going to be there who thinks that they will be. And the audience that Jesus is addressing is one who thought they had a corner on that market. You may remember the context of this passage. Jesus is still at this lunch. It's been a long lunch, has it not? We've got another week or two that we'll be there. But he's at lunch with the Pharisee. But he didn't take much time to... To, 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 to tell the truth that this group of people needed to hear. And so in verses 12 through 14, we saw that he told uh, or instructed them basically, here's how you really need to go about giving your feast. Don't invite your friends. Invite those who are poor. 
and crippled, and those who don't have the opportunity to come to a party, and those who, in fact, cannot repay you for coming. That would demonstrate a true saving faith. And he notices in verse, and of course, he's not just talking about feasts, he's talking about a lifestyle. But in verse 14, he gives the principle, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. It's obviously not teaching salvation by good works here, but he's teaching that salvation which is real will result in good works and in reaching out to others. And these guys know when Jesus said that, that it reflects his opinion that their current lifestyle did not demonstrate such a saving faith. So that part we've covered. So now we come to verse 15 today and get the response. Because one of those who was sitting there with him is reclined at table, heard these things and said to him, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now, that sounds like a very innocuous statement, right? And in fact, it is not. It's almost certainly in this context a threat behind the statement. What the guy is really saying is he's countering Jesus' claim and saying that he and his pals will certainly find a place at the table in the kingdom of God, but implying that Jesus may not. He's basically saying, yes, Me and my friends will be there. We will be blessed to break bread in God's kingdom. But we have our serious doubts about you. And Jesus is going to counter this as well by saying, yes, the kingdom. (laughs) The kingdom. The kingdom will indeed be wonderful. You're right. But let's talk further about the kingdom. And so he launches into a parable that he introduces with that first phrase, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. Now in doing this, Jesus is first of all agreeing with the man's statement that blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. You know, just an ordinary everyday feast can be a wonderful thing, right? A wedding feast, a party. We all get together, we all have a good time and it can banish hunger for a while. It can take the sadness away from the day. We all look forward to a time like that. But this, of course, this man is looking forward to the kingdom of God where he's saying, this will be a feast to to beat all feasts. This will be a feast where sadness is banished forever, where there will be no hunger forever, where it will be blessedness forever. And Jesus doesn't take issue with that because that indeed is the right way to look at the kingdom of God. The kingdom is a feast That's the assessment of Jesus as well as this man, Jesus who knows very well what the kingdom is about. In fact, in some ways, this passage kind of is suggestive to me of what we find in John 2. Excuse me, don't turn there, but you remember John 2 is the place where Jesus does his first miracle. He goes to a wedding one day and they run out of wine and Jesus turns water to wine at the wedding feast. Remember that in Cana of Galilee? Jesus does that. It's his first miracle. But you know, the, the, it always, I always wondered about this. Why, you know, turning water to wine seemed like such a trivial thing to do. And then to make a special point as John does that this is the first miracle that Jesus did. What's that all about? As I, as I grew older and, and, and learned more about the Word of God, I realized, you know what, the New, New Testament miracles are always something that John, in fact, calls signs. They're never just displays of raw, naked power in and of themselves. They're all meaningful. Uh, I think Tim Keller uses the words, they are like supernatural marquees. They're saying something about who Jesus is and why he has come. And so when he casts out demons, what is he doing? Just casting out one demon? No, he's demonstrating that he came, as 1 John 3, 8 tells us, to destroy the works of the evil one. His miracles and the things that he does are signs. And the sign at that party, at that wedding party, was a great sign indicating what? It wasn't just a frivolous display. It was indicating at the very beginning of his ministry that Jesus has come to bring unmitigated joy He's the great joy bringer. 
I, I think sometimes, and this is easy to do, and I'm sure I'm as guilty as the next person, but we think of Christianity in these kind of basic terms of, you know, don't smile too much, don't go overboard on anything, keep your nose clean, obey the rules, pass out the bulletins, um, you know, help with fellowship occasionally, forego a new car for a couple years to give to the building fund. I mean, I, I don't know what kind of restriction Christianity means to you, but we have these kind of ideas of Christianity. And, and, and beloved, our faith may demand some of these things. It does. Jesus more or less promises this. Jesus says in Matthew 8, 20, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. His life wasn't easy. Ours won't be either. And he basically promises that as the world persecuted him, it will persecute us. But at the same time, the very first thing he wanted us to know is, but in the midst of all of that, with all the circumstances that you will face, there is glory coming. There is joy unmitigated in knowing me. While Christianity is hard, it is not joyless. It's not intended to be. It's not supposed to be. Not here and now, and certainly not later on. Listen, here's a way to look at it. The world has hardships that go nowhere. But we as believers have hardships that are leading somewhere to something absolutely wonderful. And if we don't know that and we haven't really gotten that about Jesus Christ, we need to get that in our minds. Jesus is saying by the way that he did that first miracle, listen, I came to bring joy like no other joy, that, like joy the earth has never known. Where I go, the trees turn and sing and, and, and dance. All nature will bend its knee to me in Joy. If we don't understand that, we don't understand him. Listen, turn with me to Isaiah 25. Isaiah, big book in the Old Testament. So hope you can find it. Get to Psalms and then go a couple books forward to Isaiah 25. And look at this, what he says in Isaiah 25 and beginning in verse 6. Isaiah saw this. Isaiah saw some magnificent things, not only about his time, day and time, but Isaiah probably has more about future things than any other Old Testament prophet. And here's a glimpse, Isaiah 25, beginning in verse 6. He says, On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast, a feast of rich food, a feast of well aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all the peoples the veil that is spread over all nations. So he's gonna, he's gonna take up a veil. What veil? Well, the next verse tells us. He will swallow up death forever. I mean, <laughs> he will swallow up death forever. I, I think we're so attuned to some of these things in the word of God, we, we, we don't realize what we're reading sometimes. He will swallow up Death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. The kingdom's going to be wonderful. Where we're headed as a Christian is going to be joyous. It's going to be a tremendous thing. It's like this great feast. And so in his first miracle, Jesus was Acknowledging that. And then in this man who has picked out from this passage or some other passage in the Old Testament, the idea that the kingdom is like a feast, Jesus is agreeing. Yes, it is like a feast, but, but the problem was with this man and the Pharisees who were his friends and neighbors, there was a misunderstanding. And Jesus is going to address that misunderstanding, the feast that's going to come as part of the kingdom is going to be wonderful, but Jesus is going to say to these people, but it's not going to be what you think. You guys would limit the invitation list to those who are the best and brightest in your mind. You want the fun people. You want the party people. You want your friends. You don't want the lame and the halt and the crippled and those that you assign as sinners simply because of their physical condition. 
You have restrictions. But while the kingdom of heaven is going to be a feast, end all feasts, it's not going to be the kind you think. It's not going to have people get in the way you think. Those who get in will not necessarily be who you think, and maybe worst of all, there may be one less than you think. So you need to think hard about the kingdom of God. Yes, it's wonderful, but the question is, are we, will you be part of it? Because to be part of it demands a humility that the Pharisees never came close to demonstrating. They believed that the way to get in was to do all these things and keep all these rules that they had all marked down, 613 of them, with subcategories. That was their way in. They thought it was limited to the Jewish elite. So Jesus in this parable is going to show them four ways that you must humble yourselves under the kingdom if you're going to be part of this wonderful feast to come. Four ways that we can enjoy the kingdom now and be prepared for much greater joy even later on. But it requires humility. We must humble ourselves under the phasing of the, of the kingdom, under the pricelessness of the kingdom, under the priority of the kingdom, and under the proliferation of the kingdom. We'll look at each one of those. We'll take the first two this week, the next two next week. So the first thing Jesus, that I see here that Jesus is teaching us is that we must humble ourselves under the phasing of the kingdom. This was the peace that the Pharisees never could get. You say, where, do you, where in the world do you see that? Well, look at verse 16 again. He said to them, a man once gave a great banquet and invited or literally had invited many. He had invited many. So it's a parable. So it's the first thing we want to do in a parable. We want to identify the players, right? And in this one, it's not difficult at a high level. The master who gives the banquet must be God. The servant who invites, sends out the invitations, God the Son, Jesus. Part of the purpose that he's here. Those who are invited are various people groups, as we will see. But it's interesting to see that the first group is represented by the religious elite, by the Pharisees. It's the nation of Israel. They are the first invited. They've had the benefit of hundreds of years of revelation from God directly to them as a nation. And so as, it, as we saw in Isaiah 25, they are the first invited to the feast. And certain individuals within the nation of Israel have accepted the invitation. We've seen some in the temple early on when Jesus was first born. We saw Adam and we saw Simeon to a prophetess and a prophet who were there and they saw in Jesus the coming Messiah, the one who had been prophesied and they were believers. We have the disciples and some of the apostles that are following Jesus. They have accepted the invitation. But here's the point, the nation as a whole is not. The nation as a, of Israel as a whole has turned down the invitation. They are rejecting the Messiah. They are rejecting the, the one who can bring it all about. Why? because they don't see him for who he is. And the reason they don't see him for who he is is because he's not doing what they expect to bring in the kingdom. They're looking for immediate political rulership on the part of their Messiah, and that's not what they're seeing in Jesus. And so they reject him. They're basically saying, if we don't get it the way we want it, count us out. They are unbelievers because they do not understand or accept the, that the nature of the kingdom demands the rulership of Christ within the heart first so that he can then become the ruler outward later on. Nor, they, nor do they understand the phasing or the timing of the kingdom. It's implied here in verse 16 because see, verse 16 indicates that the invitation has gone out. But here's the main point, the date is unsure. We have to catch that. The invitation has gone out, but the date is unsure. We don't understand an invitation like that, right? We get an invitation and it says, come to my house, six o'clock, Friday night, party's on. This invitation didn't say that. This invitation said there's gonna be a party. I'll let you know when it's ready. That was in keeping with the custom of the time. They would often issue an invitation and it would say sort of, clear your calendar, 
we'll let you know when it's all ready. And so that's the invitation that's gone out here. A great banquet of this sort had two invitations, one that indicated a feast would be held, one telling the people when it was ready. The kingdom of heaven is like that, beloved. It's like a feast that's in preparation. We've been invited. The invitation has been issued, but we don't know exactly when it's going to occur. Here's the great news. We can have many of the benefits of the kingdom now. It's like you, you, know, it's like you can come by the place where it's being prepared and you can take a taste. You can smell it. You get, a, you get an indication of it. The Holy Spirit is given to every believer in order to seal us against that day when the, when the kingdom will come in full, but it's not in full yet. Jesus comes into our heart. Jesus begins to take up rulership within us. He's the Lord of our life if we've accepted him, right? So we have the king to guide us, to direct us, to be part of who we are. We get a taste of the kingdom, but it doesn't come in its fullness until the end. It's, it's what we've seen before earlier in Luke where the, the kingdom has this not yet and this, this already but not yet aspect to it. It's now in the sense that the invitation is out. It's now in the sense that the king is with us in our hearts, but it's later in the sense that he will come and rule and reign on this earth. It's not yet in the sense that the kingdom conditions have not been fully met. Jesus is not right now today sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. You've probably noticed that. Jesus is not today on this earth ruling with a rod of iron so that sin has been totally banished from this world. That's not true in the world we live in, is it? The, the kingdom has not come. Sin is still with us. Persecution and pain continue. Circumstances that are unfavorable or, uh, or difficult are still with us. So the kingdom is now, but it's not yet. It's phased. And the Jewish people of Jesus' time simply could not get that. They wanted it all to be now. And the more Jesus tried to explain to them that that wasn't going to be the case, the more they wanted to kill him. He couldn't possibly be Messiah because he didn't conform to their image of who Messiah would be. But for believers, the kingdom is something we can taste now. The power of the kingdom is available in our lives. It won't completely heal us now because there's a not yet to come. It doesn't completely renew our life now because there's a part that's yet to come. The old sin nature that we had before is still there residing next to the new creation that Christ has, has created in us. It's not gone yet because the kingdom isn't complete yet, but it will be. Do, do you see this? I mean, you try to explain this as, as, as carefully as I can. The kingdom has this not yet, but already phased. And it's so important to get it. It's phased in its timing. To enter a kingdom like that takes humility. You have to be willing. You, know, you have to be willing to wait. You have to humble yourself. Kind of. Let me put it this way: under the slowness of the kingdom, having accepted Christ as Savior, I'd like to have it all happen now, wouldn't you? I'd like to be rid of sin now. I'd like to see Jesus face to face now. But it's not yet. It's like you're giving a birthday party for your kids, right? Saturday's gonna be the birthday party. So you know what happens next, right? Six o'clock, Saturday morning, you're trying to sleep in, hear the kids coming pounding into your bedroom. Is it time? No, kids, not yet. Let mom and dad sleep in. You know, leave us alone for a little bit. The party's gonna be a little later. Go back to bed. So now it's eight o'clock. And they come running in from wherever they are. Is it yet? Is it now? No, kids, it's not now. We got to eat breakfast. We got to bake the cake. We have to get the yard ready. You know, there's a bunch of stuff to, you know, it's coming, but it's not yet. 11.30, having a snack for lunch, right? And the kids are coming. What? Is, it yet? Is it now? It's not yet. It's not yet, kids. We still have to, we still have to get things ready. Your friends aren't going to be here till three o'clock. And in the meantime, you know what? You got to take a nap before the, before the party. Well, that's the last straw. You know that, right? A nap. I have to take a nap. If I have to take a nap, this is not what I signed up for. If this is the way life is going to be, I don't want to live, right? That's who we are. We don't like the phasing of the kingdom. Child wants what they want. They want it now. 
all kids know is the party hasn't started yet. The parent is pleading for understanding and it takes humility to believe that dad knows best. Kids don't have humility. They have feelings. They have emotions. They have expectations. And that's exactly what the Pharisees had. They missed Christ because he didn't operate on their timetable. They missed Christ because he didn't meet their expectations. Tony uh, Campolo, some of you probably heard him or seen him. He's kind of a well-known Christian speaker. Is a son, Bart, who was following in his dad's footsteps. But a couple of years ago, Bart announced that he was no longer a Christian, that he was, had become agnostic. In fact, I read just, I think, last week, he's taken a position called a humanist chaplain at USC. I don't even know what a humanist chaplain is. It's like an oxymoron to me. You're either humanist or you're chaplain, but I don't know how you can be both. But he's a humanist chaplain now at, UNC, at USC. Somebody asked him, why have you given up your Christian faith? Here's what he said. He said the same thing a lot of people said. He said, I can't believe in a God who allows evil in the world that I see. And then he goes on, he says, I lost my faith in God. Listen to this. Because God didn't show up when I asked him to. He didn't meet my expectations. He didn't operate on my timetable. Do you see the problem with that? Number one, God did show up. 2,000 years ago, he showed up and did more than you and I will ever do in a lifetime. 2,000 years ago, he came and became us so that he could live a perfect life on our behalf, so that he could die and pay the penalty for our sins on our behalf, so that we can have the possibility of, of eternal life and salvation with God. He, be, he became part of the pain of the world. He became part of the suffering of the world. He became part of all that we go through to save us from that. God has shown up. Bart Campolo didn't want a God he can serve, he wanted a God who serves him. That's a problem. That's a problem. And that was exactly the problem with the Pharisees. They would not humble themselves under the phasing of the kingdom. Remember John the Baptist had the same problem when he got into jail, right? They're about to cut his head off. And John got a little concerned. The one who had identified Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world sent a message out and said, but, uh, but are you really? And what Jesus said to him, listen, just look. Just look at the evidence. He didn't just say believe. He said, look at the evidence. He said, haven't you read the Bible? Haven't you seen that the Messiah is going to be the one who will make blind eyes see, that will make deaf ears hear, that will release the captives? Don't you, haven't you seen that in my ministry? Don't lose heart, John, just because it's not on your timetable doesn't mean it's not real. It's real. And so all who come to the kingdom, beloved, must trust him, humbling ourselves under the phasing of the kingdom, not demanding of God, but aligning ourselves with God, realizing he has come. The invitation is now. The fulfillment will be a little further on, but meantime, we can taste the glory of the kingdom. Give yourself to that. Give yourself to believing that when you pray, whatever the answer is, is the best thing God knows for you. Believe that. Begin to taste the glory of the kingdom. It's a wonderful thing. Secondly, we have to humble ourselves under the pricelessness of the kingdom. The pricelessness of the kingdom. You say, what do you... What does that mean? Remember the MasterCard commercials a few years ago? You know, one of them, the priceless commercials. One of them, I, I guess they're still on. I, I forget what commercials are on because I zip through them now. We got a DVR. So, and I don't watch TV anyway, folks. I'm busy studying, so. <laughs> you laugh. 
the priceless commercials. You know, the, 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 the couple goes into the, into, the, into, the, into the food place at the gas station, you know, and the commercial says $3 for chips, $2 for soda, $31 for gas, starting a new life together, priceless. Well, here's the deal, beloved. Starting an eternity with Christ is the same way. It's absolutely priceless. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. You can't arrange it. You can't negotiate for it. You just can receive it because it's way too costly. It's way above your head and mind. It's way beyond our ability to pay for it. It's priceless, but it's available. It's priceless to be a part of the family of God. It's priceless to be part of the kingdom. It's priceless to have this invitation extended. It's unforgivable to turn it down. That's the issue. We all want to do something. We're born that way. Some act of kindness, some ritual. There must be something I can do to earn my way into this. But look at verse 17. At that time, for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come. 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 And then he said, what? Because everything is now ready. Everything's ready. He didn't say, he didn't say come and bring your entrance fee. He didn't say, come and bring your qualifications. He didn't say, come and... He just said, come. The banquet's ready. Well, who made it ready? The people who were invited, did they make it ready? They didn't do anything, did they? It was made ready by the Father. It's made ready by the Son. They've put the banquet together. And all we can do is come. So have you Come. Do you know that you've come? Have you come? Have you humbled yourself under the priceless of the kingdom? Have you realized that no price you could ever pay, no thing you could ever do, no obligation you think you could ever put God under would ever do that? But Jesus has already done everything there is to, is to be done. Turn, turn, turn with me to 1 Peter. 1 Peter, Peter nails this. I mean, I know he's just an old fisherman. I know we think he stuck his foot in his mouth a lot, but let me tell you, when he wrote the book of 1 Peter, he got it right. Of course, the Holy Spirit was leading him, but what a wonderful passage he gives us here. 1 Peter, we won't read the whole thing, but just look at it. Let's start in verse 3. 1 Peter 1, verse 3. 1 Peter 1, give you a minute to get there. Small, hard to find. 1 Peter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, According to our good works, he has caused us to be born again. Is that what it says? No, no. It's priceless. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And could you do that? If you could bring Jesus Christ back from the dead, you might decide you could offer something to God. If you can't do that, there's nothing you can offer. It's priceless. It's priceless. Number, verse four, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfi unfading, kept for you in heaven. It's the joy that Jesus came to bring. It's kept for you, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Do you see the... You see the already, but the not yet part of the kingdom? Here's the part that's the not yet. That's the invitation of the banquet. But it is by his mercy, not our works, he invites us to come. You can't earn this invitation. You can't negotiate for it. You can't buy it. You can't add a wing onto the hospital and suddenly it shows up. The invitation's there. It's just for us to say yes. Look at verse 18, 1 Peter 1 knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, no human works allowed, 
but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him, not through you, but through him, are believers in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. It's all done by him. When Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, that's just what he meant. It's finished. It wasn't, it's finished as soon as you add your part to it. It's finished as soon as you add your peace to it. It's it's finished as soon as you bring your goodness to it. No, it's finished. All you can do is receive it. It takes humility to do that. It takes humility to declare that all my works, all my bad things as well as all my good things, to count them as so much rubbish in the words of Paul in Philippians 3 so that I can gain Christ. Your good works can stand in the way, beloved. I read a few years ago about a, a lady named Ruth Ann Metzger. She was, a, she was a, a very good singer, lived down in Florida. I've forgotten where now, or, Orlando, I think, but somewhere down there. She was invited to sing for the wedding. And the father had arranged this for the wedding of some very wealthy family down there. And, um, and so she, she got it all, got it, her songs all prepared, and she went to the wedding, and she sang at the wedding, and then she went to the reception. But when she got to the reception, she had her husband with her. She was really looking forward to it because it was at a very fancy place. It was, you know, the layout was like something you don't see very often. And she got to the door, and there was a book. And the guy looks in the book, and he says, what's your name again? She said, Metzger, Ruthann. He said, uh, you're not here. She said, but, but I sang at the wedding. He said, I'm sorry, you're, you're not here. Your name is not in the book. She said, but, but you don't understand. I know the family. Can I, if I could just see the, the groom or talk to one of the people, no, you, there's security here. If, if you were invited, you had to accept the invitation and then your name got in the book and then you, you're allowed in. And then he called security and she was escorted out. She never got to go to the reception. It's a great picture, beloved, of the invitation God has given us. The invitation has issued. The invitation is available But she had had the invitation and then never got busy and never responded. So her name never got in the book. You gotta respond. You have to say yes. You have to just come. But you can't show up with anything other than the invitation. If you show up and say, here's, you know, $100,000. Here's $10 million. You can't buy your way in. If you show up and say, I did, I, was, I did more than David Livingston for the poor of the world, it doesn't matter. It's the invitation. It's by the blood of Christ that we are allowed in. Entrance to God's kingdom requires a humility like no other because you have to declare yourself unworthy. Pharisees could not do that, would not do that. Spurgeon used to tell a story. He had run across an epitaph somewhere, some graveyard that he was walking through, and he said there were only two words on the gravestone. But he said it was really a, it was a, it was a, he said it moved me when I saw it. Two words on the gravestone. The first word was Freddy, exclamation point. Like someone had, called out a name to this young man who had died, Freddie. And then right underneath that was the word, yes. Yes. Not yes and here's my resume. Not yes and here's my payment. Not yes and here's my good works. Just yes. I want to come. Let's pray. Father, we thank you the clarity of your word. And uh, as we continue this parable next week to see a little more of the, um, uh, some of the depth of this, we've already seen some of it, how we need to be submissive to your timing and to your call. 
Oh, there's nothing for us to bring. To enter your kingdom is absolutely priceless. There's no price we could ever pay that could ever possibly make us worthy to enter. But by the blood of Jesus Christ, it's all ours. If we'll just say yes. Now we realize, Father, that your word also teaches that even the ability to say yes is a gift from you. So uh, I just want to pray right now that you will, by the power of your Holy Spirit, prompt any heart here that doesn't know you to say yes. <clears throat> to come to faith in you. And then, Lord, I pray that you will do the work you always do in transforming lives, changing us from the inside out so that we become true kingdom people. Thank you for the invitation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.